So Fabrizio Fangi is an assistant professor of Slavic studies at Brown University, specializing in contemporary Russian culture and politics with a specific focus on the relationship between art and literature and the shaping of post-Soviet public culture. Uh, his academic interests include Soviet and post-Soviet literature and film, post-Soviet politics and ideological discourses, post-socialism, Russian nationalism and national identity, cultural studies, cultural anthropology, postmodernism, visual and iconographic aspects of Soviet culture, and many more, I'm sure. Um, his first book uh, and the subject of today's talk, it will be Fun and Terrifying Nationalism and Protest in Post-Soviet Russia, which just came out this year, uh, studies the ways in which the aesthetics and culture of Eduard Limonov's National Bolshevik Party, a radical countercultural movement, has influenced the development of Russian protest culture and the formation of state ideology during the Putin era. Um, Fabrizio, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today, uh, and please go ahead. Mute. I'm going to unmute myself. Hopefully you can all hear me. And in a second, I will start sharing my screen. Hopefully we won't have any last minute uh, technical issues that I ended up obviously having <laughs> today. But uh, uh, so first, thank you, Maya, for moderating the event and Sasha for uh, organizing it. And also thank you for the to the director of the Jordan Center, Joshua Tucker, for inviting me here today. So um, I will kind of skip the general introduction to the book, which I have in physical form, just to have some sort of materiality in this uh, kind of virtual, <laughs> in this uh, sort of virtual connection, these kind of virtual connections that, that we're all having. And uh, I will skip the, the general introduction and description to the book, which uh, uh, Maya uh, provided, adding perhaps the only thing that uh, the, the the only sort of thing that might be unexpected when hearing uh, uh, the focus of the, of the book on the National Bolshevik Party, that is the fact that the book also contains uh, uh, or covers uh, Alexander Dugin and the Eurasia movement, who were in various ways connected uh, to to this uh, organization. And uh, uh, so I will share my screen. And so the, this study of uh, this radical, sort of pioneering radical political community. Let me see if this, uh, the sharing of the screen works. Are you all seeing this? Uh, yes. Maya Ross and Vadim? Yeah, great. And let me put into play, okay, this wonderful technology. So, and uh, this, uh, the study of this radical uh, political community is based in large part on um, archival and ethnographic research that I conducted in Moscow in 2015, and uh, uh, that included uh, participant observation and over 40 interviews, in-depth interviews with uh, uh, members of this organization. So, first, uh, 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 of course, as I would say, I'm having the, sorry, it happened, it happened before, so hopefully uh, it will be okay. One second, uh, the expected technical issue did happen. Okay, so now it's somewhat sometimes, stop, oh no, because you're not seeing it. Sorry, for, sorry for this. <laughs> annoying interruption. Unfortunately, it's when, when I share the screen with you, it doesn't allow me to switch between slides, but let me see if it, uh, it did work fine earlier for mysterious reasons. It, start, it started working. So just let me see if it works now. Okay, with animation included. <laughs> so, great. So I was going to start, I'm going to start with this sort of key moment in uh, post-Soviet history or, or better sort of these two key images that kind of marked the transition uh, to the post-Soviet period and in particular this uh, symbolical place that is the uh, White House in, uh, in Moscow and uh, the place where the first Russian uh, uh, parliament existed. And it's, the, they are very symbolic of pictures in the sense and kind of captured really the, the capture really the, the, some of the uh, kind of unresolvable paradoxes of the 
post-Soviet transition. One is the picture, a uh, very famous picture showing Yeltsin standing on a tank and giving a speech uh, during the August coup that ended up uh, marking the, the end of the Soviet Union. And in this picture, obviously, the, the, the White House or the parliament kind of uh, uh, embodies, incarnates this kind of stronghold of democracy and freedom and sort of a moment of, uh, uh, the moment of a bloodless, peaceful transition to possibly a uh, new de democratic uh, system and newly acquired uh, uh, freedoms for Russian citizens. And then only two years later, this other picture that is the same building on fire during the constitutional crisis of October 1993. That was a, a very paradoxical and uh, uh, a paradoxical historical moment and one that is very difficult to, uh, to, to, to kind of interpret uh, in the sense that of course there was, and I won't try to do that in this, uh, in this context because it's far too difficult a task, but of course, this was a moment in which, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, some of the sort of conservative uh, uh, the forces within the parliament had certain, um, certain legitimate claims and uh, kind of their, their opposition to some of the economic uh, reform and shock therapy of the time were legitimate. At the same time, there were uh, radical groups and organizations, uh, uh, some of them armed, that were defending the, the White House during the uh, constitutional crisis. On the other hand, and so that, that kind of uh, uh, constituted a, tr a true sort of ex uh, real danger. On the other hand, the, the fact that the standoff was resolved violently through sort of with uh, several hundred ca casualties and the, the White House being set on fire. Uh, in, in a sense, one could say it kind of constituted the original sin of Russian, Russian democracy. And among other things, as a result of this, uh, the constitutional reform that Yeltsin uh, had approved uh, uh, caused the president, gave the president almost unlimited powers and argument, arguably paved the way for the emergence of Putin's authoritarian regime only a few years later. So, and this is, uh, but and from the point of view of uh, our talk today, uh, uh, even more importantly, what 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 is kind of the the the, the, the focus uh, of sort of, of the, in in this situation goes is the the emergence of a red brown opposition and a sort of red brown form of counterculture, red brown in the sense of uh, 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 sort of uniting leftist, radical leftist, uh, Stalinist, anarchist, uh, uh, youth countercultures and subcultures and so on and so forth, uh, kind of emerged in this moment. Or as one of my informants put it, uh, this uh, during the barricades of, of October, uh, September, October 1993, Skinheads, uh, the skinhead and the punk with the swastika earring and Stalinist nostalgics would warm up at the same fire. And obviously this was kind of a, a little bit of a motley crew for, for the obvious reason. Um, and so in terms of the sort of uh, absurdity and paradoxes, paradox that these, uh, th these images kind of uh, embody, uh, one classical reflection for the reflection of this in postmodern literature, for those of you who are familiar with it, is in Pilevin's famous novel, Generation P, that kind of uh, uh, sort of it became symbolic of uh, uh, the 1990s and the uh, transition to, uh, to, to, to democracy or the end of the Soviet Union. This, uh, this image appears as a kind of emblematic uh, advertising uh, um, uh, pitch, the, which the, the 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 slogan of which is even idiomatiechstva slada kipriatien, and even the smoke of the uh, homeland is uh, is uh, sweet and pleasant. So 
moving and of course now my thing is st stopped working again okay okay no whatever it, it's working <laughs> so moving to the next slide with some difficulties <laughs> it's the, the going into more specifically who were the figures who started uh, the national bolshevik party in this context and uh, to the left, to sort of first and foremost, uh, Edward Limonov was perhaps the uh, the, the figure who uh, who was most influential for uh, the movement in uh, different stages of its existence, and up until his death only a few months ago. And for uh, Edward Limonov was an underground poet in the Soviet Union, an emigre writer, uh, emigrated first to New York City, then to France. Um, and ended up antagonizing, or to excuse my French, pissing off pretty much everyone, Russian emigre and Soviet authorities alike, because uh, of several reasons. For uh, in, in part, first and foremost, because of his provocative statements and controversial semi-autobiographical works. Uh, he protested and criticized dissidents like Sakharov and Solzhenitsyn back in the 70s for not being forthcoming about the miserable conditions of uh, most Soviet immigrants to the West. In his novel, most famous uh, semi-autobiographical novel, Etaya Edichka, It's Me, Adi, that takes place in uh, New York, offers a semi-autobiographical semi account of Limonov's life as an outcast and des destitute Russian poet in uh, New York City and uh, uh, contains sort of uh, uh, a sort of confessional prose that is personal and intimate to the point of uh, making one cringe and uh, graphic depictions of sexual encounters with both men and women, also something that create quite a bit of scandal among Russian emigres. And, and dreams of a violent world revolution. That's something that in Limonov's life was kind of a recurring and constant theme. Uh, and later, just in, in, in another very sort of important uh, novel of his, uh, uh, Padrostok Savienko, Memoir of a Russian Punk, he kind of uh, uh, portrayed another context or another type of uh, uh, is that it's on the one hand a sort of uh, the, the, well the novel takes place in the periphery industrial periphery of Kharkov in the Soviet Union in the 50s and 60s and displays a certain fascination with the criminal world aggressive masculinity uh, and depicts a much a much sort of uh, bleaker uh, sort of uh, paints a much bleaker picture of the um, of the Soviet Union, of life in the Soviet Union, especially in the peripheries of the Soviet Union during the thaw. And finally, uh, the, to, to just give you an idea of uh, who this person was and how he inspired the emergence of the NBP or the National Bolshevik Party, well, after moving to France, where his the first novel, Taya uh, Edichka, It's Me, Adi, was first published, he became uh, uh, closer to group, groups of people uh, connected with the, uh, with the newspaper Lidio International, who was famous for, in a similar manner, kind of trying to combine provocatively right and left-wing ideology, uh, in, in, in short, with the motivation of trying to uh, make the left uh, more effective and sort of uh, not as uh, uh, establishment as it had become uh, at, at that time. And in the same sort of late 80s to 1990s, the transformation takes place in, um, in uh, uh, Limonov's uh, uh, sort of public persona and it, what, what can be called a sort of, uh, what can be called a sort of macho militant turn. Uh, he, he kind of expresses fascination with war and war people, including war criminal in ex-Yugoslavia. He travels to various, various hot spots in uh, Europe, such as ex-Yugoslavia, Pridnestrovie, uh, Abkhazia, and others. And from this period, the famous, uh, uh, is the famous video of Limonov uh, hanging out with uh, 
later condemned war, war criminal Karadzic and shooting a machine gun in the direction of Sarajevo, which uh, created quite a bit of scandal uh, among the international community and uh, uh, within the international community. At the same time, he starts publishing in Russia and in France. He is in Russia more and more often, and in the 90s, uh, uh, ultimately moves back to, uh, to Russia. Uh, he criticizes first the, uh, harshly criticizes first the perestroika and then the fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, at the same time, he becomes uh, in post-Soviet Russia in the early post-Soviet period, very much a sort of celebrity, uh, in part because of his sort of street credit as a, a countercultural and adventurous and scandalous figure. So that is Limonov, and to, so, so he was kind of one of the main uh, uh, people behind the foundation of the NVP. The second, uh, all, the second most important is Alexander Dugin, who was at the time uh, sort of much, uh, uh, sort of more kind of underground, mad, mystical artist philosopher who came out of. Uh, uh, postmodern writers Yuri Mamliev's uh, circle uh, had a fascination with the, uh, fascism in uh, all of its forms, first cultural and then uh, political, and allegedly was the one who had the idea of uh, creating this uh, red-brown coalition, telling Limonov that he would be Merlin, so the kind of theoretician and ideologue of the NDP, and Limonov would be the kind of King Arthur, being Limonov less of a thinker and more, more of a man of action, at least uh, allegedly or in terms of self-presentation. And the other two, Yegor Lietov and Sergei Kuryokhin, are people who were uh, less sort of organically connected to the movement, but had a, an important role in terms of uh, uh, affecting and influencing its aesthetics. Uh, and politics and his uh, political strategies. Yegor Lietov was the lead singer of the cult punk, Siberian punk uh, band Grazdanska Barona, uh, um, um, civil defense. Uh, and Kuryokin, uh, perhaps most importantly, was uh, uh, the avant garde musician and performer. Who, a performer who became known to the mainstream for demonstrating to Soviet TV audiences that Lenin was a mushroom. And Kuryokin was a sort of champion or the best, uh, be, the best representative or the best practitioner of Stiob, which following uh, uh, or borrowing Alexei Urchak's definition can be seen as that form of parody based on over-identification with its own object. And Kuryokin was an early supporter of the NBP, helped uh, opening the, uh, the St. Petersburg headquarters. Kuryokin was closer, what lived in, in St. Petersburg. And, uh, and uh, well, he, before dying prematurely in 1995, this, this polit sort of political participation in a radical political movement what can, could be seen as at the same time as this sort of ultimate or final uber political performance. But he also, in many respects, according to his wife and people who knew him, uh, truly believed in, in the cause in terms of uh, uh, harshly and vehemently and violently protesting against uh, um, um, the Russia, Russia's transition to capitalism and uh, uh, capitalist culture. So uh, before moving to the, of course, uh, uh, next, uh, let me see, three. Okay, I'm having some uh, issues again with my presentation, unfortunately. Let me see if it lets me do it. Uh, okay, I'll stop sharing for one second and see if I can uh, get to the transition in other ways. That's annoying. Hmm. 
let's see if, let's see if this goes better. Ma mm. Okay. Okay. But it doesn't, okay. So, so far, so far, so good. Maybe it will work. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay. So, um, a bit, so before moving to the, so, so some of these other uh, sort of visual uh, materials, uh, I want to kind of point out the fact that there are sort of uh, very different and paradoxical identities uh, of the NBP, which was at the same time a punk movement, uh, revolutionary organizations, or at least its members, uh, saw, saw themselves as members of a revolutionary organization, uh, a cult. There was a sort of a religious uh, uh, subtext to it uh, that was particularly uh, kind of uh, uh, created by Dugin. And Dugin kind of convinced and fascinated young sort of rebels of the time with a very sort of dark romantic image of himself. Again, uh, according to informants who were there at the time, what he would say to new members of the MBP was that uh, we fascist, communist, uh, uh, anarchist, uh, the, the, the punk rockers and so on and so forth, we have all been defeated and we are here only to die beautifully. And there was in that sort of a, strong cult of death, which is, was, was also part of uh, uh, an important component of the identity of NBP in all of its different incarnations throughout the years. And uh, so there was this kind of paradoxical combination of dark humor and ironic detachment, and at the same time, a romantic quasi-religious commitment to a political cause uh, and a form of sort of uh, extreme radical uh, militancy. In this sense, I kind of use the term of militant Stiob, in the sense that Stiob, this kind of parodic, ironic attitude toward, uh, toward uh, life, politics, and culture is generally seen as uh, quite cynical, ironic, and detached. The NBP kind of mixed this detached, ironic, and uh, sarcastic element with a sort of uh, we quite the opposite of it. That is this sort of romantic impulse and commitment to the cause. And so uh, to give you a little bit of an example, so a few examples of uh, what the aesthetics of the MBP uh, was when uh, the organization started its activities in the mid nineties, most important uh, was the medium, the main medium that they used to kind of uh, uh, create uh, this or address this community that is the newspaper Limonka, which was a, so one could say that, that, that through this newspaper they kind of invented uh, the, the Nuts Bolli, the members of the National Bolshevik Party, it's kind of invented a new counter cultural aesthetics that very much mixed uh, uh, the aesthetics of the historical avant-garde uh, Russian and Italian futurism, totalitarian aesthetics, uh, and, uh, and uh, various forms of uh, youth uh, counterculture and subculture, the punk and heavy metal music in particular, Limonka was sold in sort of independent music stores um, and it was important as a medium, both be, because of the sort of the aesthetics that it kind of uh, uh, created and um, invented, but also because of the sort of the making of the newspaper itself. Many of the members of the organization kind of uh, recounted how the sort of printing, organizing the newspaper was something that kind of uh, help them kind of build the community around this sort of uh, activity. Uh, and uh, again, this, uh, the, this, the, this famous symbol or infamous symbol of the NDP is this uh, sort of uh, hammer and sickle that kind of replicates, in fact, the colors and graphic of the uh, of the uh, a Nazi flag, so that was very recognizable. And of course, there was a sort of a very, uh, very punk provocative uh, uh, subtext or motivation to this decision in the sense that sort of the reference to Nazism or fascism in the Soviet Union 
uh, and for people who came from that background, was, background was the most unacceptable uh, thing that one could do. It was kind of like bad taste at its uh, at its extreme. So there was this, uh, uh, and and at the same time, it was kind of a voluntarily hyper ideologized, hyper totalitarian aesthetics uh, that kind of went very much against the. Uh, the, the mainstream of uh, Russian public culture and politics at the time that went in the opposite direction of uh, uh, pro-democratic, anti-totalitarian, but also anti-ideological or a, supposedly a-ideological uh, attitude. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, now the uh, thing stopped uh, working again. <laughs> this is extremely annoying, sorry. Uh, okay, let me see if, uh, if I can make it work again. I don't know why it decides to stop on its own, but uh, okay. So hopefully you can all see it. Hopefully I can go back to the thing. Let me see. Okay, so okay, temporarily it works, but let's let's see. Uh, so these are some of the examples of this uh, sort of irony and counter irony or post-Soviet militant job. One is the famous sort of iconic poster of Fantomas pointing a gun to the viewer, with the first uh, 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 line of the Communist International in Russian: "Stand up, you dam of the earth." Uh, this kind of uh, ironical post-apocalyptic image of uh, people uh, sort of uh, uh, sharing a gas mask in a sort of a little bit of an absurd manner and the famous sort of skeleton that that person and again this is a little bit of a dark irony and play on this kind of cult of death uh, don't piss nisi don't piss your pants I guess it's the the, the best transition, join the NBP, all under the banner of the NBP. The last the sort of thing that in terms of this aesthetics that I would like to add is that this sort of uh, red-brown uh, ideology and red-brown aesthetics and the use of these very aggressive symbols was both provocative and also a form of kind of reappropriation in the sense that in the Russian uh, media mainstream at the time, the, the, ter the term red brown, Krasna Karichneva Chuma, the red brown flag, was very much used as a sort of something like those thugs from those poor people from, uh, from the, in a very derogatory term. And so th this, this, uh, the use of these totalitarian symbols was very much a way of kind of reappropriating these derogative uh, uh, terms to, um, to make them sort of, uh, in fact, a kind of uh, uh, a, a sort of uh, the reason of uh, pride or kind of political pride, the pride of the group. Of course, uh, the, uh, the thing, uh, the, the presentation stopped working again because it just does that every slide. Again, it is increased credibly. One second. So, Brito, if it's easier for you, if you, you can just leave up the presentation without going into play and just yes. switch the slides that way so that you don't have to turn your screen off and on. Yeah, let me try to see if it works. Again, it's being mysterious. Um, uh, well, let me see if it works. Okay, so, so you I, can just I, leave it here if you'd like and you know, yeah. we see your slides, but that's all right. That way you just won't have to um, yes. turn it off and on. Yeah. Yes, I'll do that. Okay. All right. So uh, again, and uh, it was uh, since from the beginning and here there's a question of uh, space in terms of the identities of the NBP, uh, space in the sense that uh, 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 that that the organization kind of provided, uh, well, for some uh, young people, sort of a sort of oasis or, a, or kind of an alternative space in the um, kind of uh, um, uh, hyper liberal and hyper aggressive Moscow of the 1990s, and it was and it was well among other things it was a space that the space that and it was very rare for the time that it was completely free so concerts would would happen performances would happen uh, and as some of these informants des describe it it was uh, the the first 
bunker, uh, as it was called, of the MVP that was at uh, uh, metro station Trunzilska was a sort of maze where something would always happen, sort of a, a reading, a lecture, a public performance, and or, and, or a punk concert, uh, such as this one portrayed here of uh, uh, Banda Chitirioch or Bang Gang of Four. And then there was a sort of a transformation of the uh, the organization in the early 2000s that was quite a quite uh, conscious transformation. First, in uh, uh, 2001, there was an attempt at truly turning by Limonov and others at truly turning the MBP into a revolutionary army, and it was a kind of a, so sort of as many of the participants in this expedition describes it. It was a little bit of a suicidal. Uh, or uh, you, uh, similar to what uh, to Yukio Mishima's desperate uh, revolutionary moment, where they uh, tried to take over power in the Altai region at the borders of Kazakhstan. It was also a little bit of a Don Quixote moment because they only managed to purchase <coughs> a few rifles. Half of the people involved in it were actually uh, uh, agent, undercover agents of the. Uh, Russian intelligence, and because of that, Limonov uh, ended up spending two years in prison. Uh, uh, because, in part, because he had a good lawyer, he could he could have risked much worse. Uh, but be, after sort of this kind of uh, violent moment or kind of attempt at turning the organization into a true kind of armed militia, uh, quite quite consciously, the NBP becomes a sort of street avant-garde of uh, uh, the liberal opposition against Vladimir Putin, newly elected Vladimir Putin. And so from civil war to civil rights activism, uh, the Natsboli, they, uh, they, they, they become famous uh, first and foremost for their um, direct actions, uh, kind of peaceful performances that kind of have the goal of uh, showing a sort of the liberal and authoritarian nature of uh, the Russian political system. An example of this, also very iconic image, is this kind of uh, defenestration of Putin's portrait during the peaceful takeover of the Ministry of Health staged by the MBP on August 2nd, 2004. And this is also the moment in which various uh, uh, journalists, intellectuals, of also of liberal leanings become more and more uh, sympathetic, at least in this period, toward uh, the Natsboli. One of them was uh, um, Anna Politkovskaya, who ended up becoming a victim of, uh, of the regime. Another famous sort of uh, series of initiative is that of Strategy 31 that happened between 2009 and 2014, the 31st of every month with 31 days, and uh, that was a series of periodical protests uh, that had the goal of uh, uh, kind of uh, advocating for the Article 31 of the Russian Constitution, which uh, guarantees, at least theoretically, the right to free assembly. And there are sort of various images of some of these protests in Moscow and other Russian cities. And here you can see a young Nadezhda Tolakonnikova, who will become one of the leaders of Pussy Riot, participating in one of these, uh, these uh, protests. And uh, here there's the, kind of the connection that I try to retrace between the legacy of the NVP in the sense of this art political project and the art activism or the, of the art collectives Vaina and Pussy Riot. Vaina, which was kind of the first uh, collective to be created that very much used a similar, uh, well, for one thing, a similar sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, stiob uh, and irony. And there is an example of this in this uh, 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 action organized by Verna called In Memory of the Decembrists, in which the, um, the members of Verna played uh, the role of uh, uh, members of the uh, pro youth pro-government mo mo movement Nashi and staged uh, the, um, the, um, the hanging 
of a, of a transgender person and a, somebody playing as transgender person and an immigrant in the supermarket, uh, uh, one of the supermarkets, Ashan, Oshan in, uh, in Moscow. And interesting in this term, in this sense of the sort of kind of uh, hyper identity, over identification parody based on over identification is that years later, during the Pussy Riot trial, Putin famously used this, uh, this, uh, um, this uh, uh, performance to claim that Pussy Riot came out of an organization that uh, advocated uh, hanging, uh, uh, for hanging uh, the transgender and immigrant people when of course the, 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 the goal of the performance was ironic. It was not straightforward, but Putin kind of claimed that that was a straightforward uh, sort of quasi-fascist uh, uh, performance. And Pussy Riot, of course, uh, uh, that came out of the experience. Well, and the other thing that, that kind of connects, well, there were connections in terms of uh, people who participated in Vaina and uh, uh, either knew uh, the NBP or even kind of participated in it. And the members of Vaina and Pussy Riot uh, mention at various points as the sources of inspiration, both uh, Moscow conceptualists such as Dmitry Prigov, who was famously involved in one of the early performances of Vaina, and Limonov and the kind of, uh, uh, kind of angry boys, uh, the nuts bully, even I think Talakonnikova and another had uh, a, a sort of nickname for Limonov, they called him Limanadze when they referred to him and his uh, sort of being a little bit of a, a trickster, uh, early trickster in, of uh, post-Soviet politics. Uh, and at the same time, well, there, there is a sort of, uh, I, I think, more, less, perhaps less direct uh, connection with the sort of uh, uh, kind of explosion of creativity of the movement of pre-election. Of course, this was a moment in which Limonov and the, the NBP, they were, uh, they were involved with the 2011-2012 uh, protests at an early stage. And that kind of uh, 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 Limonov distanced himself from them, claiming that they were not radical enough, that they were kind of too bourgeois. So there was, uh, uh, but beyond the motivation, there was kind of a similar sort of views of irony and uh, job and creativity in terms of public protest. And the, one of the best examples is this uh, play on word from the banner from. Uh, uh, 2012, Yeslini Putin, Tokot, which was one of my favorite uh, uh, slogans that then later I discovered became a meme. And for those of you who don't speak Russian, the classic sentence that was common, wide, commonly widespread in Russian uh, mainstream media was Yeslini Putin, Tokto. So who will be the president if not Putin? And since to and Kot, they look, uh, they sound and look quite similar. This guy just created this uh, surreal uh, version of this. Uh, so at the same time, uh, in, during the 2000s, there is a sort of counter appropriation of the uh, strategies and uh, aesthetics of, of uh, uh, the NBP in the sort of mass youth pro-government movement Nashi which was in large part uh, uh, the, organized by uh, Surkov and other uh, figures close to the uh, Putin's establishment. There was a sort of conscious decision to, on the one hand, counteract the activity of the NDP, the emergence of the so-called orange revolutions, on the, what they saw as a possibility of emergence of a wave of orange revolutions on the model of the Orange Revolution in uh, Ukraine of 2004, and uh, and in terms of sort of this militant um, and uh, militant aesthetics, uh, there was kind of a conscious uh, attempt at conquering the space uh, that was occupied by uh, the MBP and other sort of uh, nationalist movements. Of course, anti-fascist and anti-anti-fascist because. Uh, Nashi was uh, uh, called uh, that was called anti-fascist movement, and the claim behind it was that they were going against Limonov 
and the liberal intelligentsia that because of their alliance with Limonov, they were also sort of liberal fascists. At the same time, Nashi itself was uh, accused of fascism and certainly violent, aggressive uh, um, um, attacks against uh, journalists and members of intelligentsia and uh, the Natsboli were often the kind of uh, ended up being the victims of uh, Nashi and sort of subgroups connected with it. And in terms of the attack, the way in which Limonov and the Natsboli were uh, uh, used prominently as a sort of uh, object or they became kind of victims of this attack, there is this book, uh, the cover of this book, as you can see with uh, uh, Adolf Hitler holding a small Limonov as a, as a puppet, where Boris Yakimienko, who was the who, who is the a historian and the brother of Yakimian uh, Vasily Yakimienko, I think uh, I might misremember his first name, but who was the leader of uh, Nashi? He had this short book, which interestingly enough, it was published as an academic book, where uh, Yakimienko analyzed all of the symbols of the NDP and the way in which they appropriated Nazi and fascist symbol to prove the point its main argument that was that Limonov was a fascist and so Nashi and the Putin's regime, they kind of had the right to persecute them. And uh, uh, the, on the other side of the spectrum, something very different happens to Alexander Dugin and a group of schismatics that come out of the, uh, of the NBP in the late 90s. Uh, that will end up uh, founding and forming the uh, Eurasia movement. Dubgin becomes a kind of staunch supporter of uh, Putin, as somebody who can bring back uh, Russia to its former uh, imperial glory, so to speak. And at the same time, uh, the, both in his writing and his, in his uh, sort of media strategy, uh, Putin, Dugin kind of uh, applies what can be seen as a sort of conservative postmodernism. So uh, here you see this uh, book, The uh, Fourth Political Theory, in which uh, uh, published in 2009, in which in very explicit terms, Dugin defines Eurasianism as the sort of dark side of postmodernism and sees a sort of this uh, Eurasian form of postmodernism as a way, as that the strategy uh, based on embracing and bringing postmodern culture to the to its extreme consequences in a very destructive with a very destructive goal that is to kind of bring all of uh, uh, modernity and the modern world to a, a complete debacle and destruction and in terms of sort of this, this destructive uh, rhetorical and aesthetic strategy, of course, Dugin himself kind of, well, for one thing, most importantly, he claimed and theorized the fact that the internet would be a great, uh, a great uh, instrument for, uh, for this kind of political strategy and activity. And uh, he himself in his self-presentation kind of embraced this strategy by kind of embodied very different also public, uh, a kind of public personas. And in, in, in this sense, uh, uh, you can look at this uh, meme that kind of uh, uh, parodies this kind of uh, uh, chameleon-like uh, uh, character of Dugin's persona that says, Kakoiti Sivodnya, who are you, which one are you today? And there are various versions of, uh, of Dugin here as this sort of Street severe monk, the kind of the rich dandy, the the the, the, the here the, in this famous uh, uh, sort of plahoy uh, Santa, the bad Santa, where he screams in this kind of possessed manner, and so on and so forth. So, and in terms of the Eurasia movement itself, and I'm kind of getting close to uh, the end of the presentation. There is, on the one hand, well, the Eurasia movement is a much more kind of a minoritarian uh, group that, uh, compared to the MBP, and one that it, that has a certain uh, kind of influence uh, on uh, Russian public culture, but one that is mostly based on kind of media strategies and what uh, perhaps today we would call trolling, right? 
and uh, so one is the the, the 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 sort of the from the beginning the identity of the Eurasia movement is developed uh, on the model of uh, quite consciously of the model of uh, Ivan Grozny's Ivan the Terrible's infamous Aprichnina. The Aprichniki were these uh, gar private guards of uh, Ivan Grozny that. Uh, a uh, kind of uh, um, uh, persecuted any possible uh, sort of conspirators against the Tsar. And there was kind of a very also carnivalesque element in the Aprichnina in the sense of this famous, if you see here, this famous dog's head that they would uh, carry around in order to kind of, the dog's head would kind of express the uh, true thoughts and true opinion of the Aprichnik and the, the broom that they used to kind of uh, swipe and clean up uh, 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 Russia. And uh, well, here you see a sort of ba banner at the Eurasianist rally, glory to the Aprichnik, uh, Aprichnia and uh, Dugin at the inauguration of the Eurasia movement um, better. Actually, it's the ESM, Eurasian Youth Movement, in Alexandrov in 2005, delivering a speech entitled, quote, the metaphysics of the Aprichnina, the symbolism of the dog's head and the sociology of repression, where he was actually consciously uh, taking the Aprichnina as a model. And internal colonization, because of course, the Aprichnina was not just a group, sort of a private militia of the Tsar, but also a separate territory. Ivan Grozny had famously moved the capital from Moscow to Alexandrov temporarily in a way to be able to kind of uh, impose uh, extraordinary measures and extraordinary power to uh, the rest of the population. And a parallel kind of identity of the Eurasia movement is the vision, well, the, 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 the vision of a conservative Bohemia, uh, the center of this uh, sort of uh, group of artists that are close to the Eurasia movement is uh, uh, Alexei Bilyaev Gintov, who uh, portrayed here, who created a uh, great scandal into, in 2008 when he was um, um, awarded the Kandinsky Prize because of his militant, aggressive, and very provocative statement many of which were kind of hyper-nationalist uh, um, and, uh, uh, and authoritarian. And here I kind of connect to the, 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 the sort of conservative, another allegedly supposedly conservative Bohemia that is uh, Timur Novikov's new academy in St. Petersburg because the new academy in, very, in many respects kind of served as a source of inspiration uh, for uh, so for the way in which kind of uh, uh, many of the artists that surround the Eurasia movement conceive of themselves and Gintov was part of the uh, new Acad St. Petersburg New Academy for a period and certainly sees uh, Novikov as a model and a teacher and at the time at the same time there is kind of this this uh, uh, in this sort of group, for, for this group of artists, um, kind of Eurasia, the Eurasian empire is very much a sort of very kind of creatively uh, imagined future hyper-technological and at the same time traditionalist um, uh, um, uh, empire. And uh, finally, sort of there is the uh, uh, conclusion in terms of what happened to the NBP and the Eurasia movement um, during Putin's third term in the sense that this was a moment in which sort of the two groups um, kind of uh, uh, in part reconciled uh, around the issue of the occupation and uh, war in Eastern Ukraine in different manners. Uh, on the, in this photo on the, Left side, you can see sort of a group of uh, Natsboli who fought uh, in one of the battalions in Ukraine on the side of uh, a separatist. Uh, and this was uh, for, for many activists, a kind of chance of realizing a, a, a dream in the sense of truly kind of fighting and being at war as an experience that they 
considered like a positive and useful experience. And at the same time, they saw sort of the, the, the NBFA kind of consistently uh, saw the sort of recreation of uh, the Soviet Union and the reconquering of the, the territories that belonged of the, to the Soviet Union as one of their goals. And Dugin that would uh, also supported uh, uh, in a sort of quite radical manner uh, uh, the aggression against uh, Ukraine and but it sort of in a different way sort of or, or playing a different role impersonating a, this different character the, a good example of which can be this sort of Dugin's guidelines that very short two minutes uh, 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 sort of journalistic uh, uh, presentation that he does, as you can see, very well groomed and almost in a sort of neoliberal uh, wrapping. Uh, one of which was the, the one where he supported Trump, uh, that was called In Trump We Trust, that was uh, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of presented as very serious, but in a way, I think it was also uh, a kind of the support for Trump was also for Dugin, part of his uh, uh, strategy of the kind of nihilistic strategy of the, the worse, the better, right? The fact that whatever is the most destructive car candidate that wins the, the American election, that's, that, that will be the, the one that will bring an end the soonest. And so uh, that, that's, that's all the better, so to speak. And so uh, I think just to conclude that uh, um, that these different uh, they're they're very sort of different incarnations and uh, uh, kind of communities that have come out of the NBFA that there is a sort of reactionary side of the project uh, that becomes appealing because of its kind of its countercultural uh, element essence or uh, background or almost street credit, uh, and there is a sort of more emancipatory sort of revolutionary side of the project that was embodied by the people who kind of uh, uh, actively protested or participated or, or kind of started, uh, initiated sort of a, a protest movement uh, throughout uh, uh, the 2000s. So it's kind of, to conclude, I would say that there is a kind of uh, um, kind of fundamental paradox uh, behind this community and the way in which it de developed. Uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, in its different incarnation, the community kind of uh, provided an important challenge to modernity, democracy, capitalism, capitalism. But at the same time, many um, many of these kind of populist movements also as in the case of the Eurasia movement, ended up supporting a, a very repressive and reactionary regime, which is something that uh, kind of remains uh, between the line or sort of denied. So, so I would kind of conclude with that and I would open it up to uh, questions. One of the issues in terms of the more recent uh, influence of the NBP is the emergence of uh, uh, red-brown ideology of various kind of populist movements in uh, Europe and other countries and the way in which these movements kind of connect or uh, have a relation to these earlier um, phenomena. So that's it. Thank you so much Fabrizio. Um, so uh, the format here again is just, if you have a question, please send it to the general chat. Um, or if you prefer to ask it out loud, um, send me a message and I will call on you. Um, so the floor is open. Should I stop sharing my screen for convenience or it doesn't matter? Yeah. Up to you. Uh, I would, yes. Yeah. Whatever okay. you want. Okay. Okay. I see. Oh, that's it. I see friendly faces. In the audience. Hi, Masha. <laughs> oh, and Bella. <laughs> and everybody. I won't say hi one one by one, but. <laughs>
Oh, hey. Um, so in, in the meantime, um, since uh, while I while I wait the questions in the chat box, I'm going to uh, take the moderator's prerogative and ask one of my own, um, which is, uh, do you think that, uh, so like uh, you and I have had a lot of conversations about the specifically like the aesthetics of various um, far right movements. Um, and one thing that occurred to me as you were speaking was, do we think that there's a connection between um, like ironic aesthetics and stop and this kind of uh, uh, deliberately unclear messaging where the uh, the recipient is not it's not necessarily clear like what should and shouldn't be taken seriously um, is there do you think there's a connection between that uh, and disinformation or misinformation uh, as another common right-wing practice in other words like is 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 it does it make sense to think about irony as the like aesthetic um, or social form of disinformation Mm -hmm. mm. Well, so it is a very difficult question, but uh, yes, certainly there is Sorry. a component. No, no, there is a, that, definitely there is an element um, that element and sort of well the the risk, so so to speak. Although risk then sounds like a little bit of a hygienic and moralistic uh, point of view on it, but the fact that it, as a strategy kind of, uh, at, well, as a sort of shimmering aesthetics or as a strategy, especially if it, if it is applied to, if it is applied to politics and perhaps what, what makes it fascinating to, to apply it to politics and kind of interesting is that it makes it even kind of edgier, right? And uh, dangerous and, uh, and complex to kind of difficult to read. So the, the kind of uh, result of this shimmering aesthetics in the realm of politics is that of course one doesn't take any position, any political ideological position. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the moral side of things. In terms of the misinformation, well, yes, I think yes, in terms definitely there, 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 there are certain over overlaps in the, uh, in the way in which Stiob was used uh, uh, in post-Soviet Russia back in the 90s and what happened, I was listening to podcasts about QAnon or the, you know, the famous sort of uh, Kill All Normies book, the way in which sort of a kind of hyper, uh, well, sort of a, a kind of a excessively compromistic attitude is kind of uh, uh, thought in a way that, uh, that, that, does, that does produce misinformation and often kind of, uh, so in terms of the internet culture, I could see definitely a, a, an analogy. With the fundamental difference, I was thinking about it because I was uh, uh, looking at some of these uh, sort of uh, internet phenomena. With the fundamental difference that that you know, for better or worse, that 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 these kind of uh, uh, figures or net uh, online networks, they're often they are often anonymous. Whereas for better or worse, these kind of uh, older guys, they kind of were 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 kind of playing, so sort of they were immersing themselves in this kind of virtual reality of uh, of uh, counter irony, right? So. For better or worse, it was affecting them. So, for instance, with Dugin, one one thing that that people who knew him and then kind of distanced himself themselves from the Eurasia movement because they really kind of started thinking that it was kind of a weird countercultural bohemian thing to do. It's that at some point they, they what they say is kind of they he built a career on this kind of hyper conservative, long bearded. Uh, persona, and at this point, he's trapped in it. You know, it's not that one day he can say, "Well, it was all a joke." Fifty-five books, extreme graphomania. I did it just to just <laughs> just to play, right? So, so the difference is that I don't know, you know uh, uh, that he was serious about it, but Ed was also serious about it. That's also a possibility, and also true at the same time. I think. Um, well, okay. Oh, sorry. No, Maya, what was you your off. doubt? No, no, what was your doubt about? No, it's, uh, it's okay. I, I want to <laughs> move through some of these questions yes. Um, yes. so that, 
that uh, we have a chance to hear from as many people as possible. Uh, so Masha asks, what do you think would defang right-wing flamboyance as a potent political force? Wait, sir, Masha, can you repeat it? Which Masha was? <laughs> yes. Masha, can I unmute can you? you? Are you, I is, you. Can you unmute yourself? I, no? Yeah, yes. there you go. Here we hi. go. Well, you I, 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 you know, hi. Hi, <laughs> I, nice I was, to see you. I, I, you know, I won 2016. Um, I was kind of excited that right wing flamboyance, which I feel like is of the type that you've been writing about, right? That, but has been around since, you know, the early 20th century in and out of sort of attention. And I feel like with Limonov and then Bepe, the kind of, you know, there were the most recent sort of blossoming of right wing flamboyance where they sort of are anti liberal stylistically. And, and that's coupled with right a certain politics that is seen as somehow conservative and, and and it sort of came to the u.s and i was wondering what do you think kind of will defang its sort of novelty and potency is it just gonna people are just gonna get tired of you know milo like sort of antics of super performative right-wing politicians mm -hmm. Or is, is there going to have to be kind of a, a change of what is the norm, the normative politics of sort of the dominant, right, and more liberal mm -hmm. procedural?ism will, will that have to change before this kind of stylistic flamboyance with coupled with conservative values stops seeing, seeming so new and appealing, I guess? I don't know if that yeah, helps. Yeah, no, no, it, no it's out a, my it's question. A, it's a yeah, it's a fantastic question. I think it's a, no, it's a great question. I think that well, on the one hand, uh, I think uh, uh, well, on the one hand, I think that if there is something positive possibly coming out of it, is the the, the possibility that this sort of a mainstream liberal culture kind of becomes a little bit less, as the chance of becoming a little bit less sort of conventional or conformist or hypocritical so that, that it has to, to have a reaction. In terms of uh, ending uh, on its own, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if it will completely finish being, uh, being effective on its own. There is the idea that I, that I, that I saw that came out in various uh, 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 media outlet, one, one that is uh, uh, Rosen, who here is involved with, but this idea of uh, reappropriating populism and there's been different people on the left who said and uh, various articles that came about in terms of even just discussing trump that the problem and sort of the uh, the sort of emergence of trump and the the reaction of uh, a sort of liberal audiences in the united states and one, one of these articles was, I, I think that was quite uh, uh sort of reasonable in its points was that the problem is not populism was saying that kind of a, there was kind of a more complicating uh picture than the one of these sort of uh, bad populists against uh, good <laughs> good uh, nuanced uh, right so i think that these are the two main things maybe at it's kind of leftist appropriation of populism, but who knows it will be ever effective. But of course, it would, it would take kind of like a conscious move on, on part of sort of uh, political agents, or at least, yes, some change that, that has, has, to, has to come. It will, it will not come on its own. I doubt it very much. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, I, it's judging by the moral panic that are sort of comes from like the last political debate, just the fact that Trump interrupted the, 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 the sort of emblematicity of interruption was so was so horrendously provocative and tantalizing to people that it does seem like flamboyance will continue to scandalize and thus continue to appeal because the the center will not budge. Yeah, I mean, but I guess I guess the reaction is part of the performance, right? That you want to, if you want to scandalize, you need your your public to be outraged. So that that only helps uh, the performer, right? Uh, I, I believe exactly. at least that's that's yes, that's it. Yeah, that's I think that's good.
Uh, so next we have from Pavel Skrinnikov a comment. Uh, Pavel, I can't see you in among the like assembled masses, but do you want to do you want to say your comment or would you like me to read it? Sure. Okay, okay. Uh, so the comment yeah. is um, just a small addition. If I remember correctly, Boris Kimenko and Vasily Kimenko are brothers. Vasily was yes. the leader of Nashe, and Boris yeah. was the one that wrote the presented book. Yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah, Boris Yakimenko is the historian. Uh, there's the brother of Vasily Yakimenko, who was the guy with the bomber jacket who organized all the sort of Nashi marches. And he's the kind of the Yakimenko Vasily was the official leader of, uh, of Nashi. Uh, in the sense of being on the field, whereas Surkov had this sort of uh, gray cardinal role, right? He, everyone knew that he was the guy behind the project, but he never said it explicitly in a very job like manner. Well, there was about Surkov, who was, uh, this is where like a sort of urban legends, but you know, there was a, there were sort of rumors about the fact that Surkov would, uh, on his way, who was this kind of neoliberal gray cardinal of the, of the Putin's administration for many years, that on his way to the Kremlin, he would stop at the Knizhny magazine Falanstir and read various sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, political books and Limonka, among other things, so that he kind of studied the enemy and then used it in it on its own. Uh, it's not that hard to believe in terms of spaces, right? It's only a few blocks away. Um, all right, next, Anastasia Mitrafanova asks, uh, could you say more about the connections between Russian nationalism and the second avant-garde, if any? Second avant-garde, in what sense? Maya? Of the avant-garde in general, historical I have, I have, I'm not sure. Um, Anastasia, are you there? Yeah, 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 I am here. Yeah, can you hear yeah. me? Uh, yes. Well, uh, I, I meant, I, I meant the second Russian uh, avant-garde, the conceptualist art and the like. Oh, oh yes. Uh, let me think. Well, yeah, I mean, there is an indirect connection in terms of. Uh, uh, well, there are sort of several indirect connections in terms of, uh, um, well, of Limonov's belonging to sort of the Moscow underground and his experience there, um, and it's, it's, and and Dugin himself being part of the Mamlev circle, though Dugin kind of the Mamlev circle, which was kind of a, kind of a like kind of a closer, less known uh, circle of people. That is kind of. Uh, uh, they thought that their avant-garde was more avant-garde than the conceptualist, if that could be the, the case. One sort of more, the, the, well, one thing that was kind of in terms of overlaps and uh, in uh, direct uh, uh, connection, uh, not really with Moscow conceptualism, but more with uh, what is sometimes called Moscow conceptualism, but is Moscow actionism of uh, Asmalowski, Brenner, and others. There was this moment in which some members of the MDP tried to convince uh, uh, and Kulik, with, uh, with some of these uh, Moscow actionists, they participated in various actions, uh, organized the, the MBP, and were sort of the, as, as uh, well, he was, he was not anonymous, so I can name him, Tsvetkov, Alexei Tsvetkov, uh, said that he was kind of trying to uh, convince the actionists to come to Limonka and to the MBP to make things even weirder. That was his, his, his explanation. Things didn't work out because of more personal things, uh, questions of Limonov uh, uh, and Dasmalovsky not getting along and so on and so forth. So there was this connection. Uh, in terms of the uh, concept, there's a more indirect, but that's more of a sort of rivalry that existed between uh, Timur Novikov's New Academy and Moscow conceptualism that kind of then uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, was transferred into a sort of uh, uh, rivalry between uh, uh, Gintov and some of the people uh, close to the Eurasianists and uh, uh, the Moscow actionists. But that is a little bit of a different overlap in the sense that Timur Novikov had his own conservative turn 
but was a little bit of a different story. He had a strong influence. There were overlaps in terms of uh, uh, people and connections, but uh, so it's a little bit of a less straightforward connection there. But, so I hope that this kind of gives a general idea. But I, um, sorry, I mean, I might, I maybe might might have, and maybe the, you know the other more indirect connections that I see in terms of aesthetics, and this I open it as a maybe question to the audience. If any one of you want to want to chip in, is that maybe you know one connection that exists in part in the mid '90s when the NBP emerged is that with the fall of the Soviet Union, the Moscow conceptualism in part arguably kind of was deprived of its object, of its primary material, which was Soviet ideology itself, and the kind of sort of edgy or uh, sort of interesting uh, revolutionary side of it became a little bit kind of not as effective. And so then as well in the sense they kind of filled a void that, that had been created by this transition. But again, I offer it as I'm, I'm happy to, uh, uh, be argued against or if you disagree with it and you think that Moscow conceptualists were great. Although again, yeah, then the overlaps don't, uh, again, there are a lot of paradoxes. This is, uh, Pri Prigo was, for instance, was an anomalous figure in the sense that he was, uh, uh, he, had, he was uh, uh, at various points close to Novikov, who was otherwise kind of a, a rival of Moscow conceptualism. And then he was very positive and enthusiastic about Vaina, who many others uh, kind of uh, underground artists criticized because of their excessively kind of militant anarchist. Uh, Prigov wanted before he died, he died uh, suddenly, but he wanted to uh, stage this, uh, this performance with Vaina. I don't know if you're familiar with it, where they wanted to uh, carry him in a closet, in a in a sort of uh, in a sort of drawer, uh, up to the stairs of MGU, while he was going to declamate some poetry, and then he got a stroke or a heart attack and ended up dying. This was 2007, and they did this famous uh, pier uh, in in honor of Pig uh, of Vaina. Uh, so there are photos that you can find on the on the internet in the Moscow Metro, where they have this long, this long table with people sort of feasting in uh, to the feast in memory of Prigov. So there was that. Uh, so again, there. Uh, so sometimes there is not just um, straightforward, but may, uh, again, I would be happy to answer other questions. Uh, so Ellen asks. Eurasian is used for various official groups. Is there a connection? What groups? For various official groups. Uh, you know, what? I mean, there are, you know, various, uh, like Eurasian Economic Commission, or Eurasian uh, Legal, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a long list if you, you know, if you yes. look for Eurasian the official. And is that sort of a, I don't know, I wink to something or I, I'm that's, just wondering. <laughs> yeah, that's and Eurasian, uh, Eurasian Un Economic Union, right? Which was yeah. the, the, well, which would be the counter. Yeah, but that's the, that's the main one. Eurasian group of countries, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, I, saw, I know that many of the, most of these organizations, uh, they're not connected in any way with the Eurasia movement. Mm. So it's, 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 it is difficult to de, to kind of determine in the sense that, it's, it, of course, there's sort of a, not an official uh, claim to direct influence. There was this moment in which uh, 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 Dugin had direct connections with uh, uh, Gennady Silesnyov, who had a sort of important political role in the Duma. and. Uh, uh, with the uh, uh, sort of Ministry of Defense, where they say that, for instance, many of his, uh, that his book, Foundations of Geopolitics, they claim that is used uh, in many sort of uh, schools organized by the Ministry of Defense. And then there's another sort of claim, but again, it's difficult to verify that, that it is true. That, so that one claim that one my, my informants made that was part of kind of the close to Dugin and others was this idea that 
he was saying, uh, well, we never we were never able to influence a sort of uh, politicians directly. What we did is that we kind of flooded the internet with our websites and our texts and our things. And the way in which he described it, and I think that that's, I mean, that's uh, probably true because if you do, you know, if you do the Evraziska Dvijenje on Google, the Dugging dominates everything. So that's, he does, and he did, and they did start very early. So in that sense, they were kind of pioneering and a little bit like the modern trolls. So what he was saying is there is a sort of some uh, ignorant and boring uh, bureau, corrupt bureaucrat who says, tells his assistant, look on Google, Eurasianism. And the guy just looks it up and the, the, this kind of informant will say that he finds my definition of Eurasianism and he steals it from me. And this is also influence. So that's the way we do it. And then, and then there was, you know, in terms of institutional uh, influence, there was this period between 2008 and 14 when then Dugin was kicked out of MGU, where he became uh, uh, kind of uh, head of the Department of Sociology which uh, uh, so, so which was you know it's, which was originally a very corrupt department. So there are people who studied the kind of how the how the department developed, and they actually say even if Dugin was bringing all of these weird conspiracy theories, was still doing better than the original people who were actually very corrupt. <laughs> At least you know he was bringing some sort of new ideas or. Uh, trying to say something original and not just plagiarizing back and forth, which is an absurd situation, of course, but. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, okay, so, uh, sorry, I'm speaking a little confused about the order of questions here, but I believe the next question is from Juliana first. Uh, what was the role of American exile on Limonov? Is that what made him a nationalist or alternatively, is he at the tail end of the 1960s search for authenticity? Uh, so Russian emigrants to America, in that sense, American. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the, the time in, his time in New York, uh, about which he basically writes in um, Eta Ya Edichka, Mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of wondering if there's a break in his intellectual trajectory um, in that time, insofar mm -hmm. as Beforehand, I mean, he's allied to smoke. He is sort of uh, hanging out with the progressive youth. There isn't really much that sort of suggests that he was going to go down the nationalist line before exile. On the other hand, um, quite a lot of other people who share the kind of spaces in the underground with him in the 60s do also end up being nationalist minded, not necessarily Russian nationalist, also other varieties. Um, and of course, most famously, Mamliev, who then becomes um, yeah. very influential for Dugan. Um, but also it goes to American exile. And he says, I become a nationalist in American exile. So there are these two forces. And I'm just wondering, what do you think is, is the one that is more influential? Is he, is he a sort of kind of um, hippie gun wacko? Or is he, um, is, he, is he something which really gets defined by this experience of exile and being mm -hmm. um, down and under? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a great question. Yes. In terms of the, I mean, I think in terms of the, Russian underground, there is that overlap that you described in various people who were part of the counterculture after the, the sort of the, the fall of the Soviet Union and after the transition. For Limonov, yeah, definitely, I think that, that his experience in the United States that defined him in the sense of uh, this kind, of, and in the sense that m many of Natsboli who kind of uh, were fascinated by his writing, they were saying, Etaya Edichka really spoke to me because he was describing this kind of desperation and total marginality in a sort of neoliberal in different world, which paradoxically was very similar to what we were experiencing in Moscow in 1995. And in terms of his influence, I think that he, he in terms of his, uh, uh, well, direct influences in terms of authors, artists, and musicians, uh, his main fascination was with the uh, countercultural figures. So there is this sort of hanging out at the CBGB in New York. He's, uh, so he's hanging out with the Ramones and the fact that he kind of reclaimed that punk was, that uh, uh, punk and national, Bolshevists were, national Bolshevism were two connected phenomena. 
And in terms of his readings and the people that he really admires, although then maybe that's kind of, could be part of his uh, posing in writing and uh, public speaking, because he, I think that if you read the, you know, the things that Olga Matic says there, he has, that for instance, he has kind of more secret uh, uh, kind of inclinations toward Russian literature, but in his open, Writing usually is kind of like he has a very cosmopolitan uh, uh, canon. So his kind of canonical authors are uh, Jean Genet. So there is that sort of uh, uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini, sort of as uh, rad radical uh, figures. So there is, there, so, it's, so I think that specifically for Limonov, even more for Dugin, who has, as Maya was doubting <laughs> my statement, he has probably some. Uh, more serious and rooted uh, uh, convictions in terms of uh, right-wing politics and nationalism, for Limonov really was uh, doing, uh, uh, kind of always being uh, on the side of being wrong, always being sort of uh, finding the symbol, the, 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 the sort of the ideology and, uh, and the thing that could outrage the, the largest amount of people. He did, though, the, in terms of nationalism, and this, this, I think he did have more of a kind of an aesthetic attraction uh, toward kind of uh, uh, aggressive masculinity. So, and he has a lot in his, of this in his prose of a, a, a sort of military uniform, strong men, even when he's talking about his kind of uh, homosexual experiences, his whole his all thing about, is about this. I had these friends in the periphery of Kharkov who were kind of tough thugs. They had, <laughs> so there is the, so I think that the, the nationalist fascination for Limonov is more aesthetic and physical than ideological. And he kind of says that because then, then you know, when he was interviewed, he was interviewed, he's interviewed, he was interviewed regularly more recently so I always said, yes, we called ourselves national Bolsheviks, but it didn't really matter. We could have called ourselves anything. In fact, I don't like the name very much. I would have, I wish we had chosen something different. So I think that that thing, it's a sort of the inclination to our counterculture that motivated him. Thank you for the great question though, everyone. Uh, how are you doing Fabrizio? I'm doing all right. You're, you're hanging in there? Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so the next question is from, I believe, um, Winston Berg. Um, uh, I would like to hear a bit more about Dugin's invocation of postmodernism. What does he and or other people in this broader movement mean by this? Uh, uh, so fascination with postmodernism, where it starts from, so, <clears throat> Uh, well, he has this discussion, especially in terms of theories in the uh, in the, the uh, in the fourth political theory. But it is really kind of a kind of long trajectory because that starts with, uh, say, a reappropriation of uh, um, uh, leftist critical theory and Gramsci and Debord on the part of the right that happens in France with uh, Alain de Benoit, who was a strong influence on Dugin. And then was a, there was a similar kind of fascination or sort of appropriation of uh, leftist critical theory on the part of du Dugin throughout the 90s that then translates into this idea of uh, kind of thinking, well, or sort of a, really a kind of move away from authenticity that somebody like Dugin, who identifies himself as a conservative revolutionary, sees in the postmodern world, maybe in a, so in a the idea of sort of very virtual connection. So I guess this, this, this meeting of ours would confirm Dugin's view on <laughs> the virtual nature of uh, postmodern reality. And what he says is basically, uh, let's, uh, let's take postmodernism that is our arch enemy because modernity, the modern world, really is our arch enemy. And here he's going after Genon, Evola, sort of conservative, very sort of radical right wing, actually more right wing than, than the fascist, if one were to be specific. Not Genon, but certainly Evola. Mussolini was 
thought that Ebola was crazy and that he was, so he was too radical on the right side of things. So, uh, uh, but, so the idea would be kind of appropriating uh, uh, postmodern uh, virtual reality and sort of this sort of fragmentation of culture and the examples that he makes uh, is uh, are sort of that the fact that uh, so uh, the figure of Che Guevara survives uh, in the t-shirt of the hipster superficial youth in the in the west and so it could kind of re-emerge uh, Che Guevara could re-emerge uh, or sort of being reincarnated as a truly revolutionary figure. Or another more terrifying version of this that he, he, he uses is the famous uh, um, Nordost uh, terrorist attack uh, in the, the, the hostage crisis of 2004, where, you know, during this musical, uh, Chechen terrorists got into the stage with machine guns and, and suicide vests. And allegedly, there is kind of this uh, this urban legend, or, or sort of uh, people say that that uh, that people in the audience initially thought that that was part of a spectacle, and uh, and so the way in which, in a very terrifying manner, uh, Dugin uh, used this as an example is saying, well, we'll we'll put this as a spectacle; it will be a funny thing. And then you like the Chechen terrorists that we really use as a model. Uh, it will be it will be not funny anymore at all, and you'll understand that we are we are acting seriously, or sort of that the violence will be real and not virtual at all. Now, so and the, it's obviously a very destructive and very radical and very terrifying uh, metaphor, especially considering the horror that was that specific episode in, in Russian history. Uh, that said, yes, uh, that said, Dugin, I think, tried to uh, co-opt more violent, aggressive, like directly, straightforwardly aggressive uh, organizations and movements, and he never fully managed to. It's true, maybe as, as one, uh, one uh, specialist in Russian nationalism that I was talking to, Verkhovsky, was saying, it's not that he would mind the violence <laughs> if it were to happen. He doesn't have necessarily more of reservations, but usually the, the straightforward violent nationalists, they get uh, normally too confused by his sort of kind of delirium about uh, Heidegger or sort of speculations about <laughs> things that get a little bit too abstract for them. That's, that's what it that is. It seems, it seems that that was often the case. Um, all right, from uh, Susan, sorry, it's, is it Hoyman? Um, it's fine. Excuse the, <laughs> um, so possibly they want to share the desire for, na for national attention that drives the current American president. Uh, I knew Limonov and hosted him when he was in New York City in the 1970s. He loved the 1960s oh. radicals at that time. It was difficult to know who he actually was. Do you know what drove him to seek attention? His nationalism may have been a path to the attention he sought. To seek attention? Well, that way, I would like, I would love to hear more about your encounter with Limonov. My, my encounter with Limonov, I, I described it after he died in the in a short article, he could be unpleasant, to be honest. <laughs> and maybe that was also part of his persona because then it's kind of a pattern. When you see him interviewed, they say, you know, in more personal interactions, he could be perhaps uh, more friendly and more pleasant, but definitely his public persona was not one. It's a strange thing because he kind of, he kind of did try to attract attention and he had a strange charismatic way, but at the same time, his public persona was quite, it's kind of like a little disturbing, standoffish, sure. not somebody, he was not somebody who was just like, no. oh, well, that, I, so I, met him, I met him a long time ago, and I think what he was doing in New York was trying to research various movements, because I was in the, I was one of the radicals of the 60s, and he right. was researching, <laughs> he was researching different personas, so he could figure out what he was, because I always remember one time he was sitting at my table, tapping his fingers, and from one minute to the next, I couldn't figure out if he was male or female. Okay, so that's what he was saying. He was saying, I don't know if I'm a man or a woman. Right, right. But he didn't say <laughs> yes. it. He didn't say it. It was the, it was, 
just the moon. Anyway, he... Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it was it kind of transformed to a masculine, uh, per, from a masculine person to a feminine one. Right, right. That's fascinating. It was really by his gestures, not by anything he said. It was what I was, what I was seeing, which was very strange. Um, yeah. Yes. Well. Well, he has he has in Etaya Edichka uh, beyond the sort of uh, sort of uh, descriptions of uh, homosexual experiences. He has this whole thing about wanting to be a woman, the fact that he has mm -hmm. been abandoned by Elena Shapova, and he wants to become like her because he's an object of desire. So yes. there's definitely <laughs> this idea of wanting to be. Loved. But, he also has the thing of but at that loved. time, he he was very he admired the left. Um, yeah. And he was he was a little out of control. I had a party, and he was taken, and uh, he was held under the shower because he was so drunk. So that's all <laughs> I don't remember. It's a very long time ago. We're talking many years ago. But anyway, we can uh, have a conversation you. another time. <laughs> but yeah, thank yeah, you. That's, it's a wonderful, that's wonderful, fascinating topic and a wonderful presentation. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank that's you. great to hear. Yes, we should talk at some point okay. when, when real, when real authentic uh, connections and <laughs> conversations yes. become possible. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank Again. you very much. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the great question. Uh, Rasan asks, um, fascinated by your discussion of uh, NVP's enduring legacies, which aspects of NVP politics and aesthetics have not aged as well? Oof, not aged as well. Uh, <laughs> well, Rasan, uh, do, you, uh, do you have anything specific in mind? Maybe, well, I think that, how would I? I really did not hear anything specific, but uh, I'm just wondering, you know, it's been really over a quarter of a century since, since the beginning and, and the, the aesthetic situation has changed so, so much and so has the political landscape, you know, a lot of the political positions possible, impossible at the time have disappeared or have become overpopulated and similarly, uh, you know, certain certain aspects of um, of the avant-garde uh, um, mm. with which they started, you know, may not have um, may not be possible now. And I, I was just wondering over the course of the um, over the course of the last quarter of a century. Um, mm -hmm. You know what has changed and what has. Uh... Mm -hmm. No, I see. I see your point. Well, I was thinking, you know, in terms of uh, the NBP itself and Limon of himself. Well, I think that there was a moment in which this this sort of narcissism that he had, especially when, uh, you know, in this wanting the revolution, sort of this desire of, of the revolution at all costs. And he kind of ended when he could not be at the center of attention that is in the whole to, to when he kind of distanced himself from uh, from the whole sort of uh, larger movement although there you know there are maybe some uh, uh well some issues that the larger movement truly had but that's that's kind of a more complicated longer question to discuss and in terms of the MVP itself yes well i don't know because i guess i guess yes there are certain well, it is a difficult question in the sense that, of course, uh, it was a very, in that sense, it was a very, sort of, and I'm thinking maybe less of the aesthetics, but in more of the way in which it existed uh, in the everyday. So it was a very analogic movement, right? It really needed a, a basement and people meeting and uh, which may be something that had, that's happening less and less. The other question is whether sort of activism that is, less online perhaps would be more effective. So that, that, that side maybe it has not necessarily aid. Uh, but but uh, yeah, maybe I should, I should think more about this question. <laughs> I might not have a definitive answer at, uh, right now. I can, but it is very, very interesting. Uh, so I think maybe uh, there's one more question here or a couple more questions. Uh, we're, I think if Fabrizio is okay with it, we can go over time to okay. um, keep the discussion going. Is that, Fabrizio, are you okay with that? Yes, yes, it's great to, you okay. know, it's great to, 
that's because you know the experience of, pu of publishing of writing a book is uh, uh, strange in the sense that uh, well I guess I'm saying something very banal but it is, it's my first time so to speak it's difficult to uh, have an idea of what readers are thinking or, <laughs> or reacting to, to to what you've been writing all along for a while so it's great that was the kind of summary of it the short version um okay so from Arsene uh, could you please talk about the scale of NDPs and the Eurasian movement support within the Russian population to what extent are they influential in Russia more broadly especially outside of Moscow uh, did or do they play particularly well with particular demographics uh, yes so well with the NDP so there was a, I actually looked at numbers to in order to be able to have a footnote on this uh at, at some point and so it's very difficult to, to trace actual numbers uh, and of participants in the sense you know the classic issues for the mbp is that you know they raised uh, uh they raised over the years the number of signature that a political organization needed to be registered as a party from 5,000 to 50,000. so at some point the mbp was able to 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 gather 50, over 50,000 signatures. But as, the, as many of the organizers and leaders were saying, that doesn't mean that we had 50,000 members. We just need that we were able to convince 50,000 people to sign a piece of paper. And uh, so uh, the MBP was quite successful uh, in relative terms. Uh, so I would say that at, at its peak, and again, it's a, sort of a deep speak in the early 2000s, there was probably something between a three, well, say one, two to 5,000 members. What, pe what, what people sort of uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, and, 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 and sort of, and this sort of the constituencies varied very much because uh, these groups often were, they were kind of independent uh of course the, the organization that done that it was not sort of uh uh too rigidly structured even if they liked to show themselves as rigidly structured with commissari and all of this bunkenfuhrer and so on and so forth uh but uh, but they were it, it was kind of kind of quite more loose so it could vary in the sense that in the provinces some of the participants could be sort of uh uh straight out skinheads uh, much cats so got much more straightforward uh, uh far right or uh, hooligans or neo-nazi or any pretty much anything but in terms of the political influence what i think that 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 the not the numbers were not what kind of for the mbp what not what it made it uh, influential, but more a the commitment of the members. So those one to five thousand were truly sort of uh, very committed on an on an average basis as the sort of uh, core of the group, and uh, and also their use their sort of media strategies. In terms of the Eurasia movement, it's actually it's actually a very very small group. They never managed it. So the Eurasia movement. It existed in sort of various editions in the more kind of a structure of political organizations, but they never managed to become, to have an actual constituency. It's really a, a, a few, a, probably a, a few people, few sort of circles of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, friends and groups. And their, their influence really exists in this sort of massive presence on the internet. So the Eurasian movement is definitely uh, very minoritarian. On the other hand, then it sort of it manages to kind of attach itself to larger sort of uh, state-sponsored uh, movements such as Nashi. They had their own uh, they had their own tent at Seligier and various other uh, pro-government uh, initiatives. And more recently, with the infamous this infamous uh, um, what's it called the Sorry, I'm having a moment of uh, Narodna and Fyodorov's uh, have, have <laughs> Fyodorov's movement and uh, uh, Narodna Nazionalna as for the detail the nod this uh, this very very kind of which has the movement that kind of uh, 
emerged uh, after uh, in 2014-15, which was kind of analogous to, to Nashi, but had a much more radical, aggressive, like a straightforwardly aggressively nationalistic uh, flair to it. And it was uh, uh, started allegedly independently, but most likely with strong state support by this congressman, Fyodorov, who's uh, uh, really radical, so for, say, say they had meetings with Strelkov in Moscow to register record while he was, after he came back from Ukraine. So quite radical and quite aggressive and nasty in their, uh, their actions. So the Eurasianists kind of uh, uh, were able to kind of attach them, themselves to them and kind of uh, have an influence or this Kat Maria Katasonova, if you heard her, also a little uh, <laughs> kind of infamous. So they, they managed on one hand this influence was they were very minoritarian in their numbers, but they had A, sort of uh, massive presence online and B, larger movements that kind of they were able to kind of influence ideologically in terms of lectures, seminars that they would organize and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, and I think we have um, one last question. Um, let me go back to it. Uh, uh, from Alexander, to what extent were Nemonov and others deliberately amplifying already in the early 1990s uh, the authoritarian aspects of the punk aesthetic. In his book, Lipstick Traces about British punk, Grail Marcus takes note of the anti-Thatcherism of the punks was, uh, that the, that the anti-Thatcherism of the punks was not completely what it seemed to be. Uh, Johnny Rotten, by the way, has come out in support of Trump. A plus. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, there was a strange, uh, so I kind of, uh, so the question is about the inherent, potentially inherently authoritarian uh, nature yeah. of the punk movement. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, uh, it, I, I'm not. I, I don't know if I have a, a sort of uh, definitive answer on this. But there were there were various cases of. Uh, 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 well, Johnny Rotten was one, and not punk, but the uh, Morrissey also. He has uh, as somebody who uh, was very kind of uh, uh, very queer in his. Uh, kind of uh, expression throughout the years and now has become quite uh, reactionary in his statement. So I don't know, I don't know if this certain the case of Limonov that uh, has, well, I guess, I guess, well, because and the, in the case of punk, the punk movement in Britain, there was the whole thing of the sort of very anti-fascist side of punk and later the uh, the sort of Nazi punk movement, the right wing side of it. So it, it became kind of very much of something related uh, to street culture. And on the other hand, there was the sort of very kind of post-punk reaction to the more leftist side of, uh, of the punk mm -hmm. movement and Joy Division and their flirting with the uh, marching and Nazi aesthetics, mm -hmm. right? So there, there's that. Side. In, in the case, perhaps I would say, in the case of Limonov specifically, I don't think that the the connection between uh, his inclination of uh, or interest in totalitarianism or uh, sort of this aggressive military aesthetics is necessarily connected to 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 punk in itself beyond this maybe a sort of a gen general affinity in the sense that. He had sort of, uh, even perhaps be, while, while he was kind of shopping for countercultures in New York, as uh, uh, Susan Human was saying, uh, he already had this, again, in his prose and poetry and throughout the years, he had this kind of, uh, kind of liking of weapons and the military regalia, right? The fact he always talked about his father who was a member of, uh, the father was a member of the NKVD, and the way he shaved, the way he had kind of to put uh, clean his uh, uh, his belt, right? The metal, the smell of the the cleaning prahasi doll that was used to kind of make the, uh, the 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 how do you call it? The metal part of the the buckle of the of the belt and the sort of shining of the boots. He had this very kind of specific uh, fascination with war and war people. 
uh, that was maybe part of where it's, so, and that's maybe what, what is kind of weird and paradoxical about Limonov, and then that kind of is reflected in the Mbepe's movement, that there is both this kind of anarchist crazy completely <laughs> and we never want to be on power we just want to do this for the sake for the sake of the revolution but you know we want to just we, if we were to win we don't want to survive the revolution because it will be boring we never want to be in power that's what all that's bully would say and at the same time a sort of this uh, fascination for this like nazi like Mm. Uh, fascist military organization, the Commissari, I'm a Bunker, Bunker Führer, this all sort of were very, very organized. So that's a little bit, I think, part of the a very a kind of very unique because even in these kind of right wing movements, uh, uh, if I think of the sort of Western subcultures, sort of the reference to uh, it, it could, there's that such well no, I guess there are paramilitary organizations or, so but it, it's kind of a more of a dip, it usually is more of a kind of separated things either you're the sort of anarchic punk radical protester or you're the sort of paramilitary skinheads the mm -hmm. two rarely mm -hmm. kind of work well together right <laughs> whereas Thank it is you. Thank you for yeah. this. Oh, of course. Hi, nice to see you, Alex. It's good to see you. Um, so at this point, uh, I think let's all thank Fabrizio. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, and probably conclude yes, the talk. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much all for the great questions and the warm participation, even at a distance. Thanks. Um, Thank Thanks. you so much, Fabrizio. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.